it wasn't you I thought it was you Don't know what to do Think I'll call you soon But it isn't true I'm finding pictures of people and the mystery is I don't know who they are and can never know. And I'm trying to produce pictures where I can give them to people who know me and they're looking at that picture and they can't tell who it is. Sometimes it's sad to look at people. When you, I don't know why, sometimes you can feel happy or you can feel sad looking at these people. I don't know who they are, I don't know what the story is, you know. Obviously to them there was no story, they were just going in the photo booth to take a functional picture. There was nothing more in it probably for them, but when I look at it, I'm seeing a snapshot of a person who's got a whole life and I don't know what that life is, but you tend to make a story up in your life of what that person is. and who they are and uh, exhibited a, a big selection of found images uh, one time in the early 90s that looked great, I had, um, it was a lot of work to stick them up by hand each one onto a, a wall really, it's, uh, we were talking 12 foot by 12 foot, nothing could be said that other than they were found images of people who I didn't know who they were. You can only go on what you've been given and I see someone there who's looking, not glum, but looking very straight-faced, very... doesn't seem to have anything that's motivating him or anything like that. Of course, I might be totally wrong. As a, 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 an image is only a snapshot of someone at that particular moment. He was probably just thinking about how this machine works because he's obviously not doing a very good job. He's looking everywhere but at the, the lens there. That one I found in 1985 and it's of a, a young lad who's smoking a cigarette and I figure he, he thought better of it and ripped it up but of course I'd follow along later in the day just by chance and have a look in the bin see what I could find and I found the pieces and stuck them together with a bit of masking tape and there we are and then we have a picture of a, a girl it's not ripped up can't see any reason why she wouldn't want that I don't know uh, this one obviously I can see why people wouldn't want it because it's a ma malfunction of the machine and that's a whole image split over the four squares of that format and it's all lopsided so that either stayed in the machine and was never seen or they took it out and of course threw it away straight away that was from sometime in London during 1982 to 85 that sort of time period and that one that's another one that I found in Nottingham in 1986 and I can't see anything wrong with that picture at all and uh, I'd be happy with that myself, it's just three lads larking about in a machine, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just looking at another nice one there, that looks pretty old, a nice colour picture there, two girls, I'll tack that on, that was found in 1987 in Shoreham near Brighton at a jumble sale. It was found in 1987, but to me, I don't know, it might be a little bit older, because when you find something and how old it is, well, you can't tell. Why would somebody want to throw that away? That looks beautiful. 
That picture is beautiful. And each of these prizes is sort of like a prize pack. There'll be two, minimum of two items in each pack. So buy your raffle tickets from my wife in the purple shirt over there. Buy your raffle tickets from yeah, there was quite a few people there over two days, you know, on midday on this night. That workshop, there's um, Anthony running, running a workshop there. Uh, there's, you'll see there's a colour booth just around here. Mm -hmm. in a, yeah, a little bit of action now, yeah. And a lot of those props, Danny brought them. Uh, you know, yeah. Danny, a uh, favourite <coughs> artist, is great. He's from, yeah. uh, uh, he's from the States. <laughs> These two girls own a photo booth company as well. Ah, right. I can't remember where, yeah. There's in America of, somewhere. There were a lot of people who, who liked, uh, who had photo booths that, um, all right. Yeah. It's actually, this is an old, <laughs> is it, uh, an old school friend of mine who happens to live in LA. Ah, okay. We used to go to school, junior school together. So you managed to yeah. meet up yeah, with I said, well, come on down, you know. Yeah, yeah. you get the closest you can get in photography to that crossover between snatched and posed images and I, I think that's what I really like. In a, yeah, in a vain way I quite like seeing how I change, how I've got older, fatter, thinner, whatever over the years. My hairstyles change, Sometimes I've worn glasses, sometimes not. Just ridiculous fashions that I've indulged in. Well, I definitely have times when I look at the images and think, oh, good God, take it away. But the collector in me won't let me throw it away. I would always keep it. It is a strange thing that you pick up these images on the floor and you've no idea who they are um, and quite often they do end up in pieces of artwork that I've, I've made. First of all look to see what kind of emotion maybe is on that person's face and whether they feel at ease or awkward or upset or happy or... I always try and think of a name, I know that's silly. There is no photographer and there's no negative and it's a very free space when you draw that curtain. It's a really private image and at that point, I suppose that's, that comes back to that idea of looking for emotion and expression in somebody's face because it's a very unself-conscious image often because that you don't feel like somebody's looking at you. Being filmed right now, I'm conscious that I'm on camera, whereas in a photo booth, I'm not. I don't think about that, and I feel uh, a lot more liberated. It is another lovely, interesting photo booth picture found again in 1985, Charing Cross in London. And it's been written on. This is quite an interesting picture because it, somebody has written on here in uh, in all honesty and they've written, this man is missing from home. If you see him, please phone. And they're leaving a, a phone number and let his family know where he is. So that seems to be some genuine effort to find somebody who's gone missing. And then they stuck this up by the machine. 
well. I didn't actually find this. A friend found it and gave it to me. Well, how long it had been there, I don't know, but I thought that was quite unusual, really. You know, that, I mean, we don't know who these people are at all, but that one's got an extra dimension to it, really, you know, that he really is missing, you know, so he's, these people, to me, are sort of missing, in a way, in that I don't know who they are, but he really was missing. It does remind me how once in 1988 or 87 or was it 86 I found a photo booth image in the bin at Midland Station, the railway station in Nottingham. I thought, oh that's nice and there was a, this bloke and, and girl and I took that home and a year later I met them and became friends with them and I still do bump into them every now and again. When I was in Berlin a couple of years ago, I was doing quite a few different projects in, in uh, a mixture of different booths there, and I kept bumping into the technician who was servicing the booths. And he um, ended up sort of being very generous, really, and allowing me to do various tester strips and things for him, and he was in some of those images and helped me with a few of the projects, which I subsequently posted up online on my blog. Um, Marco, another photo booth artist in Italy, got in touch to say, who is this guy? I've been finding images of him for years in Berlin um, and I've, I've just never known who he was. And that was quite nice just to be able to sort of solve that mystery for him. So yeah, that's a service engineer from Nottingham. That picture of him is from about 1992, which I figure must be near the end of his uh, career with the photo booth company because the first image I've got of him is from 1979 or well, one of the first images I found of him I wasn't sure who it was but after a while I worked out that uh, a service engineer would take pictures using the red curtain the blue curtain and no background at all and it was something to do with seeing how the colours worked and whether the chemicals are at the right levels and things that was a trademark which gave away it was a service engineer a machine man is the way I used to term them, the machine men. Yeah, so what's going to happen now is going to do like a set of four, so we got like here a frame and it's just us in the middle, so you have like a nice you know, picture frame of it. Because yeah? if you get a complicated big set and then you only have a short time to do it, it would be quite organised and uh, do one mistake and do the whole thing again. Yeah? And wait, so always your expensive paper. Yeah? So that, that's one, that's one strip, just of the background. And we'll do it on the second one now. Is it ready yet, or will the light come on? When the uh, photo is gone. The first picture, nobody goes in there. Second picture, me. Third picture, Alex. Fourth picture, nobody. Let's get prepared. It's me representing the East, yeah? I know when we're going to run out of uh, service. Uh, we still probably have 10 more pictures left. Running below on film. So anytime soon I have to 
change, uh, <laughs> so change the film roll. We're ready. You're Can't gonna say go. always exactly, because they're uh, sometimes a bit longer. How do you know when it's going You know kind of how many pictures are in, but then they vary. Uh, like in a normal film roll, what you buy is sometimes usually more, sometimes less. But you just keep looking, because uh, you don't want to waste any paper, because it's quite hard to get them. Expensive, huh? Are you all going on the second picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to disappoint uh, one person who might be at the end, then you go quick over and fill up the film roll again. <laughs> Here we go. It's good if you look, live local, so you can always uh, act quick, huh? with four pictures in the middle there, north, south, east, west. And that's it, job done. I had it once, it was quite funny, a guy called me and, and he was inside with his uh, girlfriend and she got naked, I think. And he was like totally out of it. So the picture didn't come out straight away and he called me and was on the phone. Hey, you have to come straight away here now. <laughs> and get the picture of my girlfriend is naked. Uh, we can't give the picture to anybody else. You know, I try to convince him and wait a little bit. And if not, I go and check it up and I'll send it to you. And he was like, yeah, yeah totally <laughs> going mad on the phone. And you have to come now. As, as if I would just uh, sleep up on the roof or something. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, that was one of the memorable uh, evenings. Yeah. <laughs> Safe and sound No need to worry when you're around Now that I've found that you're on the ground And if I saw you, would you see me too? And if I called you, would you call me too? People used to throw their pictures, their discarded pictures, didn't they, on the top? Yeah, yeah. Years they, ago, they, they you know, you've got to look the ones on the top. Who they didn't like, so they always yeah. put them on top, so you could and, always uh, uh, find some... Uh, it'd be very difficult to do that on your roof right now. Exactly. But I don't think people would throw them away like they used to. Very nondescript, there's nothing fantastically bad or great about it, but uh, as a functional picture, I, 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 I'd have used it. But then again, I don't really care what I look like. I became aware during the 80s there were other people who were using photo booths to do more than just take an everyday photo booth snap. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And just by chance, a guy who was doing a tour of Britain and he was from Yugoslavia, he popped into a friend of mine's about two, two three doors down from where I lived at the time. and. Uh, he must have related some story to them because they said, oh, there's a bloke, there's a bloke who lives three doors away from us. He, he's got loads of photo booth pictures. He was a friend of this guy I got to meet. So I went round and showed him the photographs and uh, he couldn't believe it. He says, there's a guy in Belgrade. I'd never really thought about Belgrade before. It was just another part of Eastern Europe. I really haven't really thought. And, and he, he's doing exactly the same as you. I couldn't believe it that I'd found some, you know, well, I'd found somebody or I'd heard about somebody who was doing very similar thing to me, using masks in the photo booth. I thought it was too good to be true. So I did make plans and I, I went with a friend and we flew out in the summer of 1990. Spent two weeks, met him, got on like a house on fire, similar age, rock and roll background. We had a great time. Uh, some people are listening at us at this moment in England, over out of computer and... Stuff. Of course. Right. 
let's get this over and done with. There's some folks out there listening to me right now. Alice and Sam and all the families, Mog, Mike and the Bingham crew and Dan the man, Tracy, Jock, Jim, Jude, Bart, Charlotte, Dump, Lee, Douche and all the photo boothers around the world. Wow. Well, if you're not listening, you should be. Almost the first thing we did that day was going to a photo booth, which I thought they had to do it and sort of cement our relationship by going in the photo booth. And so actually looking at this picture, you can't really tell there's any human beings in there. You can just see the top of Sasha's hair and just a touch of mine there, but to all effect it's just a, a collage. He knew me of course by my nickname Mix Up and he had a nickname. He had many different nicknames, but the one that stuck through the years was Microbe, or Microb, as you'd say in Yugoslavia. So we became Mix Up and Microbe, which had a nice ring to it, and you know we kept in contact all the time by, by post, as it would have been in them, them days, or occasional telephone call. Well, it was great to find somebody else out there who's doing something like a kindred spirit, you know, a soul brother who's doing something just the same as you almost you know we both had a shared love of photo booth machines for what they were and we both liked masks it was a catalyst for me at the time it became a big thing I planned I went back again almost uh, six months later and spent another fortnight with him in winter time we did more work together and uh, made plans for him to eventually uh, come over to Britain Sasha's masks were telling a story. They were often had a, written in Cyrillic writing, uh, some message or some uh, something else, a statement. He had a literary background, so the, he was telling stories. I wasn't really telling stories as such in mine. My, mine my were more of that moment. Change me pose a little bit. Caught me by surprise. So here we are, a copy of the face from 1986, which features a double page spread of my photo booth pictures. It's called My Life in a Photo Booth. And it's got a nice selection of pictures which are from the early to mid 80s. There's one there from 1980, a couple from 1981, 1985, that sort of time period. <laughs> Oh, 
nice one here of Prince Charles and Lady Diana and that was taken on the day they got married. Obviously we're just wearing masks. I've always really wanted my own booth. My dad built it. Um, I helped him a little bit, but really it was his skill and craftsmanship that created it for me. And this isn't quite there yet. It still hasn't got any parts in it to make it work fully as a, an analog booth. Instead, it, it's designed to work with the photobooth.net iPhone app. So it essentially is the biggest iPhone appendage ever. Yeah, I guess there is an element of ownership or possession. It's nice to have my own booth. I think for now, what I like about it is what it enables me to do in terms of having fun with others as opposed to perhaps art. Some of the early ones I did with these strips where I wanted to have my whole body going through the booth. But I quite liked the idea that it wasn't just a strip of four, that you're actually creating a much longer roll, almost like a roll of negative film, a longer piece, a bigger narrative, I guess. And getting away from the fact that usually we always just have that head and shoulders shot and I wanted it to be all of me going through. There's, so there isn't that much fun in it, really. I mean, I, I did one or two art projects where you can do things with a digital image and it can be interesting, but the fun of sitting in a booth just mm. wasn't really there. <laughs> friend did something, was trying to rig one up at either a degree show and what she wanted to do was the last the last shot that you took went on to the following person, so it was almost like out of sync, so you yeah. get a strip with somebody else's image as the top one and then they get your image on oh, the next good. one, so yeah. it kind of daisy chained it on, which I thought was really nice. Uh, and I've, I've seen that happen when machines have malfunctioned in the past, yeah. where you know you can get the half a picture appearing yeah. on one the, strip yeah. and then it's not quite lined yeah, up. It's so not it's lined up and you, yeah, that's quite kind of interesting. That is, yeah. Well, that, um, the top one's fantastic, isn't it, with the stripes and the triangles. And then the, uh, I must yeah. get a picture of you before yeah. you go, you know, to take home with me. Yeah. Yeah, well, Generally nice, to, nice to be one in, uh, yeah. you know, with the, you take the window. That's cool. And we might do it again. We could set up a similar scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do a sort of uh, walk in and out. All the chemicals down here, which get sucked up through the uh, the pipes into the processor, which your film comes through the camera down to this bit, and then on a conveyor belt goes around, and that's the process, and it's all contained inside. I have found since we've had the two booths, 
Facebook news feed has got photo booth, photo booth, photo booth. So yeah, a lot of people are just kind of coming in, photographing it, and then sharing it. But I, th- I think it is down to the the quality of what what you're getting at the end of the day. The colour one's really saturated in colour. It's really sharp. It, it, it's a nice kind of. I don't, I don't know the, the word, but it, it's, it's, it's something precious as opposed to something throw away. It's, it's something that you can hold. It's not a screen at the end of the day. We look, look at screens all day at work, at the, what, looking at computers. We go and come home and probably watch the telly, go on the computer. Having that physical item is, I think, very important. And you can print from digital, and I think if a lot more people done that, they'd dead get back to that kind of want of I want this this item this this object rather than having something that's in yeah. cyber world or megabytes When my son was born, I took him into the photo booth. Well, I've been in a photo booth since before I can remember, so uh, I'm not sure what my earliest memory of being in a photo booth is, but I know my dad took me to have a photo done before I was even registered when I was probably two, three weeks old, I think it was. But then I used to go down with him every month and take a picture of him. Of course, for the first year, I'd just hold him in my hands, but gradually, he could sit up, up there in, in the booth and for about three years I, I took him down the booth almost without fail every single month. As I got older I remember places in Nottingham that we would have gone to, the old colour photo booths. I used to go to Yugoslavia to uh, see my mate Sasha, quite regular, and um, he used to he used to have radio shows just playing eclectic music, and he used to let me play a few tunes every now and again. And his show, you know, being called the Black Market, sort of inspired me and Sam to use it as part of our band name, the Black Market Sound. sound. Is it too loud or too quiet for you guys? Especially when you're a kid, you're not really worried about being embarrassed by all the people around. It's just, you know, let's put some fun masks on and sit down and take pictures. Well, we just sort of bought it on a whim, really. Uh, Carol went to 
Paris, I think, or Berlin, and used a booth there. Oh, yeah, that was Berlin. And then started searching on forums, like, oh, how can you buy a photo booth, you know, just sort of on a whim, because she had such a good time. And then, by some chance, within a few days, this guy, whatever his name is, who we bought the booth from, I can't think now. Martin? Maybe? He, yeah, had just had something to sell. So, basically said, yeah, you can have one for 1,200 euros. It's in Estonia, but it's going to be shipped to Berlin. And then there was some pressure to make a decision very quickly. And Carol was uh, umming and ahhing, going, I don't know, should we do it, should we not do it? And I went, oh, we should definitely just buy it. What's the worst that could happen? We're going to be out of pocket, 500 pounds each. <laughs> Three years later, and about many thousands of pounds later, here we are. <laughs> quite work. <laughs> the irony of, you know, getting this photo booth and then deciding to jump on a plane to Chicago for a convention to meet people that had photo booths to figure out how to do it and then actually sitting in one and going, wow, what do I do now? I hate having my picture taken. Why have I bought a machine that is solely for that purpose? It's not lost on me and I still get in it and think, what am I going to do? I, I have a blank look on my face. Well, yeah, I mean, you can be anything in the photo booth, can't you? That's the whole what happens behind the curtain. Uh, you know, it's just you in this space and do whatever you want. And you can put on a persona, you can, you know, use props. Or you can just be you. And uh, that's the bit I struggle with. I can't put on the persona yet, I suppose. I'm just a keeper of things, of memories, and I don't know, I just like the idea that you can't, replicate that. I mean I suppose you can in a way if you're doing an art piece you can go in and keep doing things over and over again like Mix Up does to create amazing artwork but in terms of just going in and just having a go, having fun. I just like the once only. I know it's ridiculous I can't, you know I'm obsessed over that because other people don't care if you put it in a bar they wouldn't care if it's digital or not if they get four pictures they don't care but I care that it's chemical and it's old and it's brought back to life and it's you know once only. I mean, when we had the parties uh, and people came to sort of experience the photo booth, I suppose, for the first time in that way, being of a certain age where old chemical ones probably had been gone for a long time, we asked people to give us one frame to put in like a guest book and people really struggled, did not want to sacrifice one, you know. And I myself, I've done it once, I think, cut one off of a strip that I really hated, but... It just feels wrong to me to cut it up because it is an artefact, a thing that belongs in one piece. You know, and you do ones with friends and you think, well, who's going to get this one? You know, and you want to keep them all. I mean, I want to keep them all. I just, I hate the thought of having to give them away. You've given yourself a slightly separate identity. I'd had my nickname from the late 70s, actually, and it was given to me by other people, so I feel it was a, a, a fair thing to, to carry around with me. I didn't make it up myself, and uh, it became a very useful device to use. Um, maybe it, it told a, a different story to people as to who you were. In the machine, when you sat in the machine, you know, I somehow seemed to want to hide my identity, not because I was afraid of who I was, or it's not that I was I didn't mind people knowing who I was, but uh, it was part of my work that was was trying to create in a photo booth uh, something that you wouldn't usually see in a photo booth picture. Although that was something in later years I did pursue as I started to look at myself in a different light, and after maybe. 25 odd years of doing this I finally thought 
going to reveal myself in the photo booth. Everyone else has done it, and I never have. And I thought, you know, I'll, you know, if I say I've, I've had nothing to hide, it's not a fact of one in a high thing. And I quite enjoyed it actually. So I did some very plain and minimal pictures of myself. Sasha's. He, he would use masks that, would, of course, would cover his face, but again, he, there was no sense in that he was trying to hide himself at all. It was his mask was the vehicle he had for telling his story. Tako, pirat će u stvari mix-up muziku. Uh, kako si muziku izabrao mix-up? What music you, you have chosen? Sasha died a couple of years ago and a very sad moment for me and everybody else who knew him and he was a well-known man in Belgrade but he died penniless as an artist living in his mum and dad's house which I thought was great in a way it said everything to me about who he was he was you know his work was his life <laughs> the high.